Part three, chapter one of Mushrooms on the Moor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part three, chapter one. When the cows come home. I can see them now as they come, very slowly and in single file, down the winding old lane. The declining sun is shining through the tops of the poplars. The zest of daytime begins to soften into the hush and cool of evening when they come leisurely saunting through the grass that grows luxuriously beside the road. One after another they come quietly along. Cherry and brindle, blossom and darky, beauty and crinkle, daisy and pearl. A stranger watching them as they appear round the bend of the pretty old lane fancies each of them to be the last, and has just abandoned all hope of seeing another when the next pair of horns makes its unexpected appearance. They never hurry home, they just come. A particularly tempting wisp in the long sweet grass under the hedge will induce an instant halt. The least thing passing along the road stops the whole procession, and they stare fixedly at the intruder till he is well on his way. And then, with no attempt to make up for lost time, they jog along at the same old pace once more. It is good to watch them. When the whirl of life is too much for me, when my brain reels and my temples throb, when the hurry around me distracts my spirits and disturbs my peace, when I get caught in the tumult and bustle and the rush, then I like to throw myself back in my chair for a moment and close my eyes. I'm back once more in the dear old lane among the haws and the filberts. I catch once more the smell of the briar. I see again the squirrel up there in the oak and the rabbit under the hedge. I listen as of old to the chirp of the grasshopper in the stubble, to the hum of the bees among the foxgloves, to the song of the blackbird on the hawthorn, and best of all, yes, best of all for brain unsteadied and nerve unstrung, I see the cows coming home. It is a great thing to be able to believe the whole day long that, when evening comes, the cows will all come home. That is the faith of the milkmaid. As the day drags on, she looks through the lattice windows and catches occasional glimpses of cherry and brindle, blossom and darky, beauty and crinkle, daisy and pearl. They are always wandering farther and farther away across the fields, but she keeps a quiet heart. In her deepest soul she cherishes a lovely secret. She knows that when the sunbeams slant through the tall poplar spires the cows will all come home. She does not pretend to understand the mysterious instinct that will later on turn the faces of cherry and brindle towards her. She cannot explain the wondrous force that will direct Blossom and Darkie into the old lane, and guide them along its folds to the white gate down by the byre. But where she cannot trace, she trusts. All day long she clings to her sunny faith without wavering. She never doubts for a moment that the cows will all come home. Is there anything in the wide world more beautiful than the confidence of a good woman in the salvation of her children? For years they cluster around her knee. She reads with them prays with them, welcomes their childish confidences. Then one by one away they go. The heat of the day may bring waywardness and even shame, but like the milkmaid watching the cows through the lattice, she is sure that they will all come home. Think of Susanna Wesley with her great family of nineteen children around her. What a wonderful story it is, the tale of her personal care and individual solicitude for the spiritual welfare of each of them. And what a picture it is that Sir A. T. Quiller Couch has painted of the holy woman's deathbed. John arrives and is welcomed at the door by poor Hetty, the prodigal daughter. The end is very near, a few hours, perhaps, Hetty tells him. And she is happy? Ah, so happy. Hetty's eyes brimmed with tears, and she turned away. Sister, that happiness is for you, too. Why have you, alone of us, so far rejected it? Hetty stepped to the door with a feeble gesture of the hands. She knew that, worn as he was with his journey, if she gave him the chance he would grasp it and pause, even while his mother panted her last, to wrestle for and win a soul, not because she, Hetty, was his sister, but simply because hers was a soul to be saved. Yes, and she foresaw that sooner or later he would win, that she would be swept into the flame of his conquest. She craved only to be let alone. She feared all new experience. She distrusted even the joy of salvation. Life had been too hard for Hetty. And on another page we have an extract from Charles's journal. I prayed by my sister, a gracious, tender, trembling soul, a bruised reed which the Lord will not break. The cows had all come home. The milkmaid's faith had not failed. The happiest people in the world, and the best, are the people who go through life as the milkmaid goes through the day, believing that before night the cows will all come home. It is a faith that does not lend itself to apologetics, but like the coming of the cows it seems to work out with amazing regularity. It is what Myrtle Reed would call a woman's reasoning. It is because it is. The cows will all come home because the cows will all come home. 
Quote, Good wife, what are you singing for? You know we've lost the hay. And what we'll do with the horse and kai is more than I can say. While like as not with storm and rain we'll lose both corn and wheat, she looked up with a pleasant face and answered low and sweet. There is a heart, there is a hand, we feel but cannot see. We've always been provided for and we shall always be. That's like a woman's reasoning, we must because we must. She softly said, I reason not, I only work and trust. The harvest may redeem the hay, keep heart whate'er betide. When one door shut, I've always found another open wide. There is a heart, there is a hand, we feel but cannot see. We've always been provided for and we shall always be. End quote. The fact is that the milkmaid has a kind of understanding with Providence. She is in league with the Eternal, and Providence has a way of its own of keeping faith with trustful hearts like hers. I was reading the other day Commander J. W. Gambier's Links in My Life, and was amused at the curious inconsistency which led the author first to sneer at Providence, and then to bear striking witness to its fidelity. As a young fellow, the commander came to Australia and worked on a way-back station, but he had soon had enough. I was to try what fortune could do for a poor man, but I believed in personal endeavor and the recognition of it by Providence. I did not know Providence. I did not know Providence, sneers our young bushman. The cows will all come home, says the happy milkmaid. But on the very same page that contains the sneer, Commander Gambier tells a story. When he was leaving England, the old cabman who drove him to the station said to him, If you see my son Tom in Australia, ask him to write home and tell us how he's getting on. I explained, the commander tells us, that Australia was a big country and asked him if he had any idea of the name of the place his son had gone to. He had not. As soon as Commander Gambier arrived at Newcastle in South Wales, he met an exceptionally ragged ostler. As the ostler handed him his horse, Mr. Gambier felt an irresistible though inexplicable conviction that this was the old cabman's son. He felt absolutely sure of it. So he said, Your name's Fowles, isn't it? He looked amazed and seemed to think that his questioner had some special reason for asking him, and was at first disinclined to answer. But Mr. Gambier pressed him and said, Your father, the Cheltenham cab driver, asked me to look you up. He then admitted that he was the man, and Mr. Gambier urged him to write his father. All this on the selfsame page as the ugly sneer about Providence. And a dozen pages further on I came upon a still more striking story. Commander Gambier was very unfortunate, very homesick, and very miserable in Australia. He could not make up his mind whether to stay here or return to England. At last, he says, I resolved to leave it to fate. The only difference that I can discover between the Providence whom Commander Gambier could not trust and the fate to which he was prepared to submit all his fortunes is that the former is spelt with a capital letter and the latter with a small one. But to the story, quote, On the road where I stood was a small bush grog shop, and the coaches pulled up here to refresh their ever-thirsty bush traveler. At this spot, the upcountry and downcountry coaches met, and I resolved that I would get into whichever came in first, leaving it to destiny to settle. Looking down the long straight track over which the upcountry coach must come, I saw a cloud of dust, and well can I remember the curious sensation I had that I was about to turn my back upon England forever. But in the other direction, a belt of scrub hid the view, the road making a sharp turn. And then, almost simultaneously, I heard a loud crack of a whip, and round this corner, at full gallop, came the down coach, pulling up the shanty not three minutes before the other. I felt like a man reprieved, for my heart was really set on going home, and I jumped up into the down coach with a great sense of relief. End quote. And thus Mr. Gambier returned to England, became a commander in the British Navy, and one of the most distinguished ornaments of the service. He sneers at Providence, yet trusts to fate, and leaves everything to destiny. The milkmaids may be an inexplicable confidence, but this is an inexplicable confusion. Both are being guided by the same hand, the hand that leads the cows home. She sees it and sings. He scouts it and sneers. That is the only difference. Carlyle spent the early years of his literary life, until he was nearly forty, among the moss hogs and isolation of Craig and Puddock. It was, Fruta says, the dreariest spot in all the British dominions. The house was gaunt and hungry-looking, standing like an island in a sea of morass. When he felt the lure of London and determined to fling himself into its tumult, he took one of the biggest plunges that a man might take. But in that hour of crisis he built his faith on one great golden word. All things work together for good to them that love God, he wrote to his brother. And later on, when his mother was in great distress at the departure of her son, Alec, for America, Carlyle sent her the same text. You have had much to suffer, dear mother, he wrote, and are grown old in this valley of tears. But you say always, as all of us should say, have we not many mercies too? 
is there not above all and in all a father watching over us through whom all sorrows shall yet work together for good yes it is even so let us try to hold by that as an anchor both sure and steadfast which is another way of saying it is all right mother mine let them wander as they will whilst the sun is high when it slants through the poplars the cows will all come home the homeward movement of the cows is part of the harmony of the universe man himself goeth forth the psalmist says unto his work and unto his labour until the evening until the evening and then like the cows he comes home in this sense of harmony between the coming of the cows on the one hand and all their environment on the other that gave gray the opening thought for his elgin in a country churchyard the curfew tolls the knell of parting day the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lee the ploughman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me here are two pictures the tired ploughman and the lowing herd both coming home and the two together make up a perfect harmony it is a stroke of poetic genius we are made to feel the weariness of the tired ploughman in order that we might be able to appreciate the restfulness of the evening the solitude of the quiet churchyard and the cows coming slowly home i blamed myself at the beginning for sometimes getting caught in the fever and tumult of life but then if i never knew such exhausting experiences i should never be able to enjoy the delicious stillness of the evening i should never be able to see the beauty of the herd winding so slowly o'er the lee it is just because the ploughman has toiled so hard and done his work so well that his weariness blends so perfectly with the restfulness of the dusk for it is only those who have bravely borne the burden in the heat of day who can relish the sweetness and peace of the twilight it is a man's duty to keep things in their right place i do not mean merely that he should keep his hat in the hall and his book on the shelf i mean that as far as possible a man ought to keep his toil to the daylight and his rest to the dusk dr chalmers held that our threescore years and ten are really seven decades corresponding with the seven days of the week six of them he said should be spent in strenuous endeavour but the seventh is the sabbath of the lord thy god and should be spent in sabbatic quiet that ideal is not always capable of realization for the matter of that it is not always possible to abstain from the work on the lord's day but it is good to keep it before us as an ideal we may at least determine that on the sunday we will perform only the deeds of necessity and mercy and in the same way we may resolve that we will leave as little work as possible to be done in the twilight of life it was one of the chiefest of the prophets who told us that it is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth if i were the director of a life insurance company i should have that great word blazoned over the portal of the office if by straining an extra nerve in the heyday of his powers a man may ensure to himself some immunity from care in the evening he is under a solemn obligation to do so the weary ploughman has no right to labour after the cows come home for in some respects the sweetest part of the day follows the coming of the cows i have a notion that most of the old folk would say so during the day they fancied that the cows had gone to return no more but they all came home and now says old margaret ogilvy and now it has all come true like a dream i can call to mind not one little thing i ettled for in my lusty days that hasn't been put into my hands in my old age i sit here useless surrounded by the gratification of all my wishes and all my ambitions and at times i am near terrified for it's as if god had mistaken me for some other woman they wandered long that is to say and they wandered far but they all came home cherry and brindle blossom and darky beauty and crinkle daisy and pearl they all came home happy are all they who sing in their souls the milkmaid's song and never never doubt that when the twilight gathers round them the cows will all come home end of part three chapter one part three chapter two of mushrooms on the moor this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part 3. Chapter 2. Mushrooms on the Moor. Mr. G. K. Chesterton does not like mushrooms. That is the most arresting fact that I have gleaned from reading, carefully and with delight, his Victorian Age in Literature. In his treatment of Dickens, he writes very contemptuously of that little Bethel to which Kit's mother went, and he likens it to a monstrous mushroom that grows in the moonshine and dies in the dawn. Now, no man who was really fond of the esculent and homely fungus would have employed such a metaphor by way of disparagement. 
i can only infer that mr chesterton thinks mushrooms very nasty his opinion of little bethel does not concern me it is neither here nor there but mr chesterton does not like mushrooms i cannot get over that i feel very sorry for mr chesterton it is not merely a matter of taste i would not presume to set my opinion in a matter of this kind over his but the authorities are with me i have looked up the encyclopaedia britannica and its opening sentence on the subject affirms that there are few more delicious members of the vegetable kingdom than the common mushroom i suppose that in these matters association has a lot to do with it i cannot forget those delicious summer mornings in england when we boys rising with the lark stole out of the house like so many burglars and scampered with our baskets across the fragrant meadows to gather the white buttons that dotted the sparkling dew-drenched grass it was as i have said in the introduction to this book a large part of childhood's radiant romance what tales our fancy wove into the fairy rings under the elm trees we lifted each moist fungus half expecting to see the brownies and elves fly from beneath it and what fearsome care we took to include no single hypocritical toadstool among our treasures i am really afraid that mr chesterton would have been less conscientious mushrooms and toadstools are all alike to him he can never have had such frolics in the fields as we enjoyed in those ecstatic summer mornings and he never therefore knew the fierce joy of the breakfast that followed when hungry as hunters we returned with flushed faces to feast upon the spoils of our boisterous foray over such brave memories mr chesterton cannot fondly linger for mr chesterton does not like mushrooms what would the harvester have said to mr chesterton for to jean stratton porter's hero mushrooms were halfway to destiny in the morning brilliant sunshine awoke him and he arose to find the earth steaming if ever there was a perfect mushroom morning he said to his dog we must hurry and feed the stock and ourselves and gather some the harvester breakfasted fed the stock hitched betsy to the spring wagon and went into the dripping steamy woods if any one had asked him that morning concerning his idea of heaven he would never have dreamed of describing gold-paved streets crystal pillars jewelled gates and thrones of ivory he would have told you that the woods on a damp sunny may morning was heaven he only opened his soul to beauty and steadily climbed the hill to the crest and then down the other side to the rich half-shaded half-open spaces where big rough mushrooms sprang in a night yes a mushroom morning was heaven to the harvester and it was the mushrooms that led him the first step of the way towards the discovery of his dream girl the mushrooms represented the first of those golden stairs by which he climbed to his paradise and mr chesterton does not like mushrooms what would the harvester have said to mr chesterton one faint struggling glimmer of hope i am delighted to discover mr chesterton likens little bethel to a monstrous mushroom there can be only one reason for this inartistic mixture of analogy and antithesis mr chesterton evidently knows that a large mushroom is not so sweet or so toothsome as a small one a monstrous mushroom even to those who like mushrooms is coarse and less tasty now the gleam of hope lies in the circumstance that mr chesterton knows the fine gradations of niceness or nastiness that distinguish mushrooms of one size from mushrooms of another as a rule if you get to know a thing you get to like it mr chesterton is coming to know mushrooms he will soon be ordering them for breakfast he may even come like certain tribes mentioned in the encyclopedia to eat nothing else and by that time he may have come to know little bethel and if he comes to know it he may come to like it he will still liken it to a mushroom but we shall be able to tell by the way he says it that he means it is very good and we shall see at once that mr chesterton likes mushrooms at present however the stern fact remains mr chesterton does not like mushrooms richard jeffreys at his amateur poacher says that mushrooms are good either raw or cooked the great naturalist is therefore altogether on the side of the encyclopedia some eat mushrooms raw fresh as taken from the ground with a little salt but to me the taste is then too strong perhaps that is how mr chesterton has taken his mushrooms and little bethel of the many ways of cooking mushrooms richard jeffreys goes on the simplest is the best that is on a gridiron mr chesterton gives the impression that is precisely how he would prefer his mushrooms and little bethel for mr chesterton 
does not like mushrooms. The really extraordinary feature of the whole thing is that I like mushrooms all the better, for the very reason that leads Mr. Chesterton to pour upon them his most withering and pitiless contempt. He hates them because they spring up in the night. Little Bethel is a monstrous mushroom that grows in the moonshine. It is perfectly true that Little Bethel, like the mushrooms, flourished in the darkness. Like Mark Tapley, she was at her brightest when her surroundings were most dreary. In this respect, both the meeting house and the mushrooms are in excellent company. Many fine things grow in the night. Indeed, Sir James Crichton Brown, the great doctor, in his lecture on sleep, argues that all things that grow at all grow in the night. Night is nature's growing time. Now Michael Fairless shared Richard Jeffrey's fondness for mushrooms. Every reader of The Roadmender will recall the night in the woods. Through the still night I heard the nightingales calling, 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 until I could bear it no longer, and went softly out into the luminous dark. The wood was manifold with sound. I heard my little brothers who moved by night rustling in grass and tree. And above and through it all the nightingales sang and sang and sang. The night wind bent the listening trees, and the stars yearned earthwards to hear the song of deathless love. Louder and louder the wonderful notes rose and fell in a passion of melody, and then sank to rest on that low, thrilling call which it is said death once heard and stayed his hand. At last there was silence. The grey dawn awoke and stole with trailing robes across earth's floor. Gathering a pile of mushrooms, children of the night, I hasten home. The nightingales, the singers of the night. The mushrooms, the children of the night. These singers of the night and these children of the night almost remind me of Faber. Angels of Jesus, angels of light, singing to welcome the pilgrims of the night. But Mr. Chesterton does not like the children of the night. Now, we must really learn better manners. It will not do to treat things contemptuously, either because they spring up suddenly or because they spring up in the night. In this matter, we Australians live in glass houses and must not throw stones. Mr. Chesterton is treading on our pet corns, for Australia and America are the two most monstrous mushrooms on the face of the earth. Like the nations of which the prophet wrote, they were born in a day. Think of what happened in America in the ten short years between 1830 and 1840. No nation in the history of the world can produce so astounding a record. In 1830, America had 23 miles of railway. In 1840, she had 800 in 1830, the country presented all the wilder characteristics of an early colonial settlement. In 1840, it was a great and populous nation. In 1830, Chicago was a frontier fort. In 1840, Chicago was a city. In 1830, the population of Michigan was 32,000. In 1840, it was 212,000. It was during this sensational decade, too, that the first steamships crossed the Atlantic and the spirit of the age reflected itself in the literary wealth of which America became possessed at that extraordinary time. Whittier and Longfellow, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Nathaniel Hawthorne, Emerson and Bancroft, Poe and Prescott, all arose during that eventful period, and made for themselves names that have become classical and immortal. Here is a monstrous mushroom for you. Or, to pass from the things of yesterday to the things of today, see how, under the shadow of the Rocky Mountains, Canadian cities are, in our own time, shooting up with positively incredible swiftness. No, no, Mr. Chesterton must not speak disparagingly of mushrooms. And look at the rapidity at which these young nations beneath the Southern Cross sprang into existence. I remember standing on the seashore in New Zealand, talking to a couple of old whalers, who told me of the times they spent before the first emigrant ships arrived, when they were the only white men for hundreds of miles around. And now, why, in their own lifetime these men had seen a great nation spring into being. Here, I say again, are mushrooms for you. But do mushrooms really spring up as suddenly as they appear to do? Dan Crawford tells us that, in Central Africa, if a young missionary attempts to prove the existence of God, the natives laugh, and pointing to the wonders of nature around, exclaim, No rain, no mushrooms. In effect, they mean to say without some adequate cause. If there were no God, whence came the forest and the fauna? Now that African proverb is very suggestive, No rain, no mushrooms. The mushroom, that is to say, has its roots away back in old rainstorms, in fallen forests, 
and in ancient climatic experiences too subtle to trace. I have been reading Dr. Cook's textbook, and he and Mr. Cuthill have convinced me that it takes about a million years to grow a mushroom. The conditions out of which the fungus suddenly springs are as old as the world itself, and the same consideration saves America and Australia from contempt. For both America and Australia, these mushroom nations, are very, very old. Dr. Stanley Hall, the president of the Clark University, was speaking on this aspect of things the other day. In a very pregnant psychological sense, he said, ours is an unhistoric land. Our very constitution had a Minerva birth. That is a classical way of saying that it had a mushroom birth. Our literature, customs, fashions, institutions, and legislation were inherited or copied, and our religion was not a gradual indigenous growth, but both its spirit and its forms were imported ready-made from Holland, Rome, England, and Palestine. No country is so precociously old for its years. It follows, therefore, that Australia is as old as the empire, and the empire has its roots away back where the first man delved. We must not allow ourselves to be duped by the trickery of appearances. These new things are very ancient. How long did it take you to paint that picture? Somebody asked Sir Joshua Reynolds. All my life, he replied. Anybody can grow fine flowers in the daytime, but what can you grow in the dark? That is the challenge of the mushrooms. What can you grow in the dark? The nights are the test, as Charlotte Bronte used to say. When things were black as black could be, poor Charlotte wrote, the days pass in a slow, dark march, the nights are the test, the sudden wakings from restless sleep, the revived knowledge that one sister lies in her grave, and another not at my side, but in a separate and sick bed. The nights are the test. They are indeed. Tell me, can you grow faith and restfulness and patience and a quiet heart in the darkness? If so, you will never speak contemptuously of mushrooms again. Why, dear me, some of the very finest things in this world of ours spring up suddenly like the mushroom, and spring up in the dark. Dean Hall used to tell how he became a preacher. For years he could not lift his eyes from his manuscript. Then, one Sunday evening, the light suddenly failed. His manuscript was useless, and he found himself speaking heart to heart to his people. The eloquence for which he was afterwards famed appeared in a moment, and appeared in the dark and I am very fond of that story of the old American soldier. He was stone blind but very happy, and always wore his medal on his breast. What do you do in these days of darkness? somebody asked him. Do? he replied almost scornfully. Why, I thank God that for fifty years I had the gift of sight. I saw Abraham Lincoln, and heard the bugles call for the victory of truth and righteousness. I go back to those scenes now, and realize them anew. I have lost my sight, but memory has been born again in the dark. If, therefore, we allow mushrooms to be treated with contempt, simply because they spring up suddenly and spring up in the night, we shall soon find other beautiful things, much more precious, brought under the same cruel condemnation. And what of a sudden conversion? Think of Down in Water Street, and Broken Earthenware, and Varieties of Religious Experience. What of that tremendous happening on the road to Damascus? The Philippian jailer, too. See him with a grim smile of satisfaction, locking the apostles in their terrible dungeon. Yet, before the night is through, he is tenderly bathing their stripes and ministering to them with all the gentle graces of Christian courtesy and compassion. A monstrous mushroom that grew in the night, would you call it? At any rate, it did not die with the dawn. Minerva births these with a vengeance. As for me, I have nothing but reverence for the mushrooms. They are among the wonders of a very wondrous world. End of Part 3, Section 2。Part 3, Chapter 3 of Mushrooms on the Moor。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank Borum. Part 3, Chapter 3. Onions. Just along the old rut-riddled road that winds through the bush on its way to Bullman's Gully, there lives a poor old man who fancies that he is of no use in the world. I'm going to send him an onion. I am convinced that it will cure him of his most distressing malady. I shall wrap it up in tissue paper, pack it in a dainty box, 
tie it with silk ribbons, and post it without delay. No gift could be more appropriate. The good man's argument is very plausible, but an onion will draw out all its defects. He thinks, because he never hears any voice trumpeting his fame or chanting his praise, that he is therefore without any real worth or value to his fellow men. Could anything be more preposterous? Who ever heard of a panegyric in praise of onions? At what concert was the song of the onion sung? Roses and violets, daisies and daffodils are the theme of every warbler, but when does the onion come in for adulation? Run through your great poets and show me the epic, or even the sonnet, addressed to the onion. Are we therefore to assume that onions have no value in a world like this? What a wealth of appetizing piquancy would vanish from our tables if the onion were to come no more. As a relish, as a food, and as a medicine, the onion is simply invaluable. Yet no orator ever loses himself in rhetorical transports in honor of onions. It is clearly not safe to assume that because we are not much praised, we are therefore of not much profit. And so I repeat my suggestion that if any man is known to be depressed over his apparent uselessness, it would be a service to humanity in general, and to that member of the race in particular, to post him an onion. I always bless God for making anything so strong as an onion, exclaimed William Morris, in a fine and characteristic burst of fervor. That is the point. An onion is so strong. The very strength of a thing often militates against applause. If a strong man lifted a bag of potatoes, we should think no more about it. But if a schoolboy picked it up and ran off with it, we should be speechless with amazement. We take the strength of the strong for granted. It is the strength of the weak that we applaud. If a man is known to be good or useful or great, we treat his goodness or usefulness or greatness as one of the given factors of life's intricate problem, and straightway dismiss it from our minds. It is when goodness or usefulness or greatness breaks out in unexpected places or in unexpected people that we vociferously shout our praise. We applaud the singers at a concert because it appeals to us as such an amazing and delightful incongruity that so practical and prosaic a creature as man should suddenly burst into melody. But when the angels sang at Bethlehem, the shepherds never thought of clapping. The onion is therefore in company with the angels. I am not surprised that the Egyptians accorded the onion divine honors and carved its image on their monuments. I am prepared to admit that onions do not move in the atmosphere of sentiment and poetry. Tears have been shed over onions, as every housewife knows. Shakespeare speaks of the tears that live in an onion, but as Shakespeare implies, they are crocodile tears, without tenderness and without emotion. Old John Walcott, the satirist, tells how, quote, Master Broadbrim poured over his father's will and dropped the onioned tear, and Bernard Shaw writes of the undertaker's handkerchief, duly onioned with some pathetic phrase. No, onions do not lend themselves to passion or pathos. You would scarcely decorate the church with onions for your sister's wedding, or plant a row of onions on a hero's grave. And yet I scarcely know why. For in a suitable setting, a touch of warm romance may light up even so apparently prosaic a theme. The coming of the swallows in the spring is scarcely a more delightful event in Cornwall than the annual arrival of the onion sellers from Brittany. What a picturesque world we invade when we get among those dreamy old fishing villages that dot the Cornish coast. Gold mists upon the sea and sky, the hills are wrapped in silver veils, the fishing boats at anchor lie, nor flap their idle orange sails. The wind and rugged sea-front is itself suggestive of rich romance and reminiscent of bold adventure. The smugglers, the pirates, the wreckers, and the Spanish mariners knew every bluff and headland perfectly. And however the world beyond may have changed, these tiny hamlets have triumphantly defied the teeth of time. They know no alteration. The brogue of the people is strange but rhythmic, and though pleasant to hear, very hard for ordinary mortals to understand. The fisher-folk, with their strapping and stalwart forms, their bronzed and weather-beaten features, their dark idyllic eyes, their tanned and swarthy skins, their odd and old-world garb, together with their general air of being the daughters of the ocean and the sons of the storm, seem to be a race by themselves. And he who tarries long enough among them to become infected by the charm of their secluded and well-ordered lives knows that one of the events of their uneventful year is the coming of the onion sellers from over the sea. The historic connection between Cornwall and Brittany is very ancient, and is a romance in itself. The English and French coasts, as they face each other there, are very much alike, broken, precipitous, and grand. The peoples live pretty much the same kind of lives on either side of the channel, and when the onion sellers come from France they are greeted with enthusiasm by the Cornish people, and although they speak their own tongue they are perfectly understood. 
see there is one of the breton onion sellers lounging among a knot of fishermen near the door of yonder picturesque old cornish cottage whilst the wife stands in the open doorway arms akimbo listening as the foreigner tells of the things that he has seen across the channel since he last visited this coast and up the hill there on the rickety old settle beneath the creaking signboard of the village inn is another such group as i gaze upon these masculine but kindly faces i am half inclined to withdraw my too hasty admission that onions have nothing about them of sentiment poetry or romance it always strikes me as a funny thing about onions that however fond a man may be of the onions themselves he detests things that are oniony give him onions and he will devour them with magnificent relish but through some slip in the kitchen let his porridge or tea taste of onions and his wry face is a sight worth seeing a friend of mine keeps a large apiary one summer he was in great glee at the immense stores of honey that his bees were collecting then one dreadful day he tasted it the dainty little square of comb oozing with the exuding fluid was passed round the table horror sat on every face it turned out that the bees had discovered a large onion plantation some distance away and they had gathered their heavy stores from that odorous and tainted source what could be more abominable even to a lover of onions than oniony honey we remember thackeray and his oniony sandwiches now why is it possible for me to love onions and hate all things oniony the fact is that the world has a few vigorous decided elementary things that absolutely decline to be modified or watered down onions is onions as a well-known character in fiction remarked on a memorable occasion and there is a world of significance in the bald assertion there are some things that are as old as the world and as universal as man and that are too vivid and pronounced to humble their pride or compromise their own distinctive glory the exquisite shock of the bather as his naked body plunges into the flowing tide the instinctive recoil on seeing for the first time a dead human body the delicious thrill with which the lover presses for the first time his lady's lips the terrifying roar of a lion the flaunting scarlet of a poppy and the inimitable flavor of an onion these are among the world's most familiar quantities the things that decline to be modified or changed you might as well ask for an ice cream with the chill off as to ask for a diluted edition of any of these vivid and primitive things onions may be regarded by a man as simply delicious but oniony honey or oniony tea the bather's plunge is a rapture to every stinging and startled nerve in the body but to stand ankle deep in the surf shivering with folded arms in the breeze that scatters the spray life is full of delightful things that are a transport to the soul if we take them as they are but that become a torrent and an abomination if we water them down and it is just because christianity itself is so distinctive so outstanding so boldly pronounced a thing that we insist on its being unadulterated even a worldling feels that a christian to be tolerable must be out and out the man who waters down his religion is like the shivering bather who feeling the cold cold waters tickling his toes cannot muster up the courage to plunge he is like the man who wants an ice cream with the chill off he is like oniony honey or oniony tea a man cannot of course live upon onions onions have their place and purpose and as i have said are simply invaluable but they must be kept to that place and to that purpose the modern tendency is to eat nothing but onions we are fast becoming the victims of a perfect passion for piquancy time was when we expected our newspapers to tell us the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth we don't care a rap about the truth now so long as it'll give us a thrill we must have onions we used to demand of the novelist a love story now he must be morbidly sexual and grimly sensational our grandfathers went to a magic lantern entertainment and thought it a furious frolic and on sundays they prayed from lightning and tempest from plague pestilence and famine from battle and murder and from sudden death good lord deliver us their grandchildren pray from all churches and chapels good lord deliver us and during the week they like to see all the blood-curdling horrors of lightning and tempest of plague pestilence and famine of battle murder and sudden death enacted before their starting eyes with never a flicker to remind them that the film is only a film the dramas the dances and the dresses of the period fortify my contention the cry is for onions and the stronger the better it is not a healthy sign mr h g wells in his graphic description of the changes that overcame bromstead and turned it from green fields into filthy slums says that he noticed that there seemed to be more boards in the railway line every time i passed advertising pills and pickles tonics and condiments and such like solicitudes of a people with no natural health or appetite left in them the pills that is to say kept pace with the pickles the more pickles bromstead ate the more pills bromstead wanted that was the worst of the passion for piquancy the soul grows sick if it is fed on sensations onions are splendid things but you cannot live upon onions 
pickles inevitably lead to pills. But that is not all. For the trouble is that, if I develop an inordinate appetite for onions, I lose all relish for more delicately flavored foods. The most impressive instance of such a dietary tragedy is recorded in my Bible. The children of Israel wept and said, We remember the onions, but now there is nothing except this manna before our eyes. Onions seem to have a special connection with Egypt. Herodotus tells us that the men who built the pyramids fed upon onions, although the priests were forbidden to touch them. We remember the onions, cried the children of Israel, looking wistfully back at Egypt, but now we have nothing but this manna. The onions actually destroyed their appetite for angels' food. That, I repeat, is the most mournful aspect of our modern and insatiable passion for piquancy. If I let my soul absorb itself in the sensational novel, the hair-raising drama, and the blood-curdling film, I find myself losing appreciation for the finer and gentler things in life. I no longer glory as I used to in the sweetness of the morning air and the glitter of the dew-drenched grasses, in the purling stream and in the fern-draped hills, in the curling waves and the twinkling stars. The bound of the hare and the flight of the seabird lose their charm for me. The world is robbed of its wonder and its witchery when my eyes grow accustomed to the gaudy, blinding glare. Jenny Lind was asked why she renounced the stage. She was sitting at the moment on the stands by the seaside with her Bible on her knee. She pointed her questioner to the setting sun, transforming the ocean into a sea of glory. I found, she said, that I was losing my taste for that, and, holding up her Bible, my taste for this, so I gave it up. She was a wise woman. Onions are fine things in their own way. God has undoubtedly left a place in his world for the strong, vivid, elemental things. But they must be kept to that place. God has strewn the ground around me with the food that angels eat, and I must allow nothing on earth to destroy my taste for such sublime and wondrous fare. End of Part 3, Chapter 3《Part Three, Chapter Four of Mushrooms on the Moor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank Borum. Part Three, Chapter Four. On Getting Over Things. We get over things. It is the most amazing faculty that we possess. War or pestilence, drought or famine, fire or flood, it does not matter. However devastating the catastrophe, however frightful the slaughter, however total the eclipse, we surmount our sorrows and find ourselves still smiling when the storm is overpassed. I remember once penetrating into the wild and desolate interior of New Zealand. From a jagged and lonely eminence I surveyed a landscape that almost frightened me. Not a house was in sight, nor a road, nor a living creature, nor any sign of civilization. I looked in every direction at what seemed to have been the work of angry titans. Far as the eye could see, the earth around me appeared to have been a battlefield on which an army of giants had pelted each other with mountains. The whole country was broken, weird, precipitous, and grand. In every direction, huge cliffs towered perpendicularly about you. Bottomless abysses yawned at your feet, and every scarped pinnacle and beetling crag scowled menacingly at your littleness and scowled defiance at your approach. One wondered by what titanic forces the country had been so ruthlessly crushed and crumbled and torn to shreds. Did any startled eye witness this volcanic frolic? What a sight it must have been to have watched these towering ranges split and scattered, to have seen the placid snow-clad heights shivered like fragile vases to fragments, to have beheld the mountains tossed about like pebbles, to have seen the valleys torn and rent and twisted, and the rivers flung back in terror to make for themselves new channels as best they could. It must have been a fearsome and wondrous spectacle to have observed the slumbering forces of the universe in such a burst of passion. Nature must have despaired of her quiet and sylvan landscape. It is ruined, she sobbed. It can never be the same again. No, it can never be the same again. The bright colors of the kaleidoscope do not form the same mosaic a second time. But nature has got over her grief for all that. For see, all up these tortured and angular valleys, the great evergreen bush is growing in luxurious profusion. Every slope is densely clothed with a glorious tangle of magnificent forestry. From the branches that wave triumphantly from the dizzy heights above to those that mingle with the delicate mosses in the valley, the verdure nowhere knows a break. Even on the steep rocky faces, the persistent vegetation somehow finds for itself a precarious foothold, and where the trees fear to venture, the lichen atones for their absence. Up through every crack and cranny, the ferns are pushing their graceful fronds. It is a marvelous recovery. 
indeed the landscape is really better worth seeing to-day than in those tranquil days centuries ago before the titans lost their temper and began to splinter the summits travellers in south america frequently comment upon the same phenomenon prescott tells us how cortez on his historic march to mexico passed through regions that had once gleamed with volcanic fires the whole country had been swept by the flames and torn by the fury of these frightful eruptions as the traveller presses on his road passes along vast tracts of lava bristling in the innumerable fantastic forms into which the fiery torrent has been thrown by the obstacles in its career but as he casts his eye down some steep slope or almost unfathomable ravine on the margin of the road he sees their depths glowing with the rich blooms and enamelled vegetation of the tropics his vision sweeps across plains of exuberant fertility almost impervious from thickets of aromatic shrubs and wild flowers in the midst of which tower up trees of that magnificent growth which is found only in these latitudes it is an intoxicating panorama of brilliant colour and sweetest perfume kingsley and wallace too remark upon these great volcanic rents and gashes that have been healed by verdure of rare magnificence and orchids of surpassing loveliness even the gardens of england were a desert in comparison all around them were orange and lemon trees the fruit of which in that strange coloured light of the fireflies flashed in their eyes like balls of burnished gold and emerald while great white tassels swinging from every tree in the breeze which swept the glade tossed in their faces a fragrant snow of blossoms and glittering drops of perfumed dew it is thus that like the oyster that conceals its scar beneath a pearl nature heals her wounds with loveliness she gets over things and so do we for after all the world about us is but a shadow a transitory and flickering shadow of the actual and greater world within us yes the incomparably greater world within us for what is a world of grass and granite compared with a world of blood and tears what is the cleaving of an alp compared with the breaking of a heart what is the sweep of a tornado the roar of a prairie fire or the booming thunder of an avalanche compared with the cry of a child in pain all visible things as carlyle has taught us quote, are emblems what thou seest is not there on its own account strictly speaking it is not there at all matter exists only spiritually and to represent some idea and body it forth End quote. the soul is liable to great volcanic processes there come to it tragic and tremendous hours when all its depths are broken up all its landmarks shattered and all its streams turned rudely back for weal or for woe everything is suddenly and strangely changed amidst the crash of ruin and the loss of all the soul sobs out its pitiful lament everything has gone it cries i can never be the same again i can never get over it but time is a great healer his touch is so gentle that the poor patient is not conscious of its pressure the days pass and the weeks and the months and the years like the trees that start from the rocky faces and the ferns that creep out of every cranny in the ruined horizon new interests steal imperceptibly into life there come new faces new loves new thoughts and new sympathies the heart responds to fresh influences and bravely declines to die and whilst the days that are dead are embalmed in costliest spices and lie in the most holy place of the temple of memory the soul discovers with surprise that it has surmounted the cruel shock of earlier shipwreck and can once more greet the sea i am writing in days of war the situation is without precedent a dozen nations are in death grips with each other twenty million men are in the field every hour brings us news of ships that have been sunk regiments that have been annihilated thousands of brave men who have been slaughtered never since the world began were so many men writhing in mortal anguish so many women weeping so many children fatherless and while a hundred thousand women know that they will see no more the face that was all the world to them millions of others are sleepless with haunting fear and terrible anxiety and every day i hear good men moan that the world can never be the same again we shall never get over it they tell me it is the old mistake the mistake that we always make in the hour of our sad and bitter grief we shall never get over it of course we shall and as the fields are sweeter and the flowers exhale a richer perfume after the thunderclouds have broken and the storm has spent its strength so shall we find ourselves living in a kindlier world when the anguish of today is overpassed much of our old civilization with its veneer of politeness and its heart of barbarism will have been riven as the ranges were riven by the earthquake but out of the wreckage shall come the healthier day the wounds will heal as they always heal and the scars will stay as they always stay but they will stay to warn us against perpetuating our ancient follies empires will never again regard their militarism as their pride surely this torrent of blood that is streaming through the trenches and crimsoning the seas is sacrificial blood 
it is an ancient principle and of loftiest sanction that it is sometimes good for one man to die that many may be saved from destruction if out of its present agony the world emerges into the peace and sunshine of a holier day every man who has laid down his life in the awful struggle will have died in that sacred and vicarious way this generation will have wept and bled and suffered that unborn generations may go scatheless it is the old story no mortal born without the dew of solemn pain on mother's brow no harvests golden yield save through the toiling and tearing of the plough it was only through the cross that the saviour of men found a way into the joy that was set before him and the world therefore cannot expect to come to its own along a bloodless road the recuperative forces that lurk within us are the divinest things about us i cut my hand and before the knife is well out of the gash a million invisible agents are at work to repair the damage it is our irrepressible faculty for getting over things no minister can have failed at some time or other to stand in amazement before it we have all known men who were not only wicked but who bore in their body the marks of their vice it was stamped upon the face it was evident in the stoop of the frame it betrayed itself in the shuffle that should have been astride we have known such men i say and heard their pitiful confessions and the most heart-rending thing about them was their despair they could not believe that the love of god was vast enough to find room for them but just look look at me a man said to me one night remembering what he once was and surveying the wreckage that remained look at me and truly it was a sight to make angels weep i can never be the same again he said in effect i can never get over it but he did and there is as much difference between the man i saw that night and the man who greets me to-day as there was between the man whom he remembered and the man he then surveyed it is wonderful how the old light returns to the eye the old grace to the form the old buoyancy to the step and how with these a new softness creeps into the countenance and a new gentleness into the voice when the things that wound are thrown away and the healing powers get their chance it is only then that we really discover the marvel of getting over things indeed unless we are on our guard this magical faculty will be our undoing the tendency is as we have seen to return to our earlier state to recover from the change and the forces that work in that direction do not pause to ask if the change that has come about is a change for the better or a change for the worse they only know that a cataclysmic change has been effected and that it is their business to help us back to our first and natural condition but there are changes that sometime overtake us from which we do not wish to recover and we must be on ceaseless vigil against the well-meaning forces that only live to abolish all signs of alteration no man ever yet threw off his old self and entered into new life without being conscious that millions of invisible toilers were at work to undo the change that had been effected they are helping him to get over it and he must firmly decline their misdirected offices father said young dr ralph dexter to the old doctor in the spinner in the sun father it may be because i'm young but i hold before me very strongly the ideals of our profession it seems to me a very beautiful and wonderful life that is opening up before me always to help to give to heal i feel as though i had been dedicated to some sacred calling some lifelong service and service means brotherhood you'll get over that returned the old doctor curtly yet not without a certain secret admiration you'll get over that when you've had to engage a lawyer to collect your modest wages for your uplifting work the healed not being sufficiently grateful to pay the healer when you've gone ten miles in the dead of winter at midnight to take a pin out of a squalling baby's back why you may change your mind and later on in the same story myrtle reed gives us another dialogue between the two doctors i may be wrong remarked ralph but i've always believed that nothing is so bad that it can't be made better the unfailing earmark of youth the old man replies you'll get over that old dr dexter is quite right good or bad the tendency is to get over things many a man has entered his business or profession with the highest and most roseate ideals and the tragedy of his life lay in the fact that he recovered from them yes there is nothing that we cannot get over a recuperative faculty no no limit none of our diseases are incurable i knew an old lady who really thought that her malady was fatal she fancied that she could never recover she even told me that the doctor had informed her that her case was hopeless she lay back upon her pillow and her snowy hair shamed the witnesses about her i shall never get over it she sighed i shall never get over it but she did we sang rock of ages beside her sunlit grave this afternoon end of part three chapter four part three chapter five of mushrooms on the moor this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part 3, Chapter 5. Naming the Baby. Wild horses shall not drag from me the wonderful secret that suggested my theme. Suffice it to say that it had to do with the naming of a baby. And the naming of a baby is really one of the most momentous events upon which the sentinel stars look down. There is more in it than a cursory observer would suppose. Tennyson recognized this when his first son was born, the son who was destined to become the biographer of his distinguished sire and the governor-general of our Australian commonwealth. Whilst reveling in the proud ecstasies of early fatherhood, he sought the companionship of his intimate friend, Henry Hallam, the historian. They were strolling together one day in a beautiful English churchyard. "'What name do you mean to give him?' asked Hallam. "'Well, we thought of calling him Hallam,' replied the poet. "'Oh, had you not better call him Alfred after yourself?' suggested the historian. "'I,' replied the naive bard. "'But what if he should turn out to be a fool?' "'Ah, there's the rub. It turned out all right as it happened.' The boy was no fool, as the world very well knows, but if you examine the story under a microscope, you will discover that it is encrusted with a golden wealth of philosophy. For the point is that the baby's name sets before the baby a certain standard of achievement. The baby's name commits the baby to something. Names, even in ordinary life of the home and the street, are infinitely more than mere tags attached to us for purposes of convenience and identification. In describing the striking experiences through which he passed on being made a freeman, Booker T. Washington, the slave who carved his way to statesmanship, tells us that his greatest difficulty lay in regard to a name. Slaves have no names. No authentic genealogy, no family history, no ancestral traditions. They have, therefore, nothing to live up to. Mr. Booker Washington himself invented his own name. More than once, he says, quote, I tried to picture myself in the position of a boy or a man with an honored and distinguished ancestry. As it is, I have no idea who my grandmother was. The very fact that the white boy is conscious that, if he fails, he will disgrace the whole family record, is of tremendous value in helping him to resist temptations. And the fact that the individual has behind him a proud family history serves as a stimulus to help him overcome obstacles when striving for success. End quote. Every student of biography knows how frequently men have been restrained from doing evil, or inspired to lofty achievement, by the honor in which a cherished memory has compelled them to hold the names they are allowed to bear. Every schoolboy knows the story of the Grecian coward whose name was Alexander. His cowardice seemed the more contemptible because of his distinguished name, and his commander, Alexander the Great, ordered him either to change his name or to prove himself brave. I notice that the American people have lately been rudely awakened to a recognition of the fact that a nation that can boast of a splendid galaxy of illustrious names stands involved not only in a great and priceless heritage, but also in a weighty national responsibility. Three citizens of the United States, bearing three of the most distinguished names in American history, have recently figured with painful prominence before the criminal courts of that country. It is not rarely, as a leading American journal remarks, quote, that a man who has acquired credit and reputation ruins his own good name by some act of fraud or passion. It is much rarer that the case appears of one who soils the good name of a distinguished father. But it is without parallel that three names, borne by men the most famous in our annals, should all have been so foully soiled by their sons. End quote. And the pitiable element in the case is not relieved by the circumstance that these unhappy men have clearly inherited, with their father's names, something of their father's genius. The fact is that American soil has proved singularly congenial to the growth of greatness. The length of America's scroll of fame is altogether out of proportion to the brevity of her history. The stirring epochs of her short career have developed a phenomenal wealth of leaders in all the arts and crafts of national life. In statesmanship, in arms, in letters, and in inventive science, she can produce a record of which many nations, very much older, might be pardonably proud. And she therefore displays a perfectly natural and honorable solicitude when she looks with serious concern on the untoward happenings that have recently smudged some of those fair names which she so justly regards as the shining hoard and cherished legacy which have been bequeathed to her by a singularly eventful past. Names, exclaims Carlyle's Tufelstrach, Quote, could I unfold the influence of names, I were a second greater Trismegistus. End quote. Names occupy a place in literature peculiarly their own. From Homer downwards, all great writers have recognized their magical value. The most superficial readers of the Iliad and the Odyssey must have noticed how liberally every page is sprinkled with capital letters. The name of a god or of a hero blazes like an oriflame in almost every line. 
and macaulay in accounting for the peculiar charm of milton says that none of his poems are more generally known or more frequently repeated than those that are little more than muster rolls of names Quote, they are not always more appropriate he says or more melodious than other names but they are charmed names every one of them is the first link in a long chain of associated ideas like the dwelling place of our infancy revisited in manhood like the song of our country heard in a strange land these names produce upon us an effect wholly independent of their intrinsic value one transports us back to a remote period of history another places us before the novel scenes and manners of a distant region a third evokes all the dear classical recollections of childhood the schoolroom the dog-eared virgil the holiday and the prize a fourth brings before us the splendid phantoms of chivalrous romance the trophied lists the embroidered housings the quaint devices the haunted forests the enchanted gardens the achievements of enamoured knights and the smiles of rescued princesses End quote. to tell the whole truth i rather suspect that macaulay appreciated this subtle art so highly in milton because he himself had mastered the trick so thoroughly he knew what magic slumbered in that wondrous wand his own dexterity in conjuring with heroic names is at least as marvellous as milton's in his victorian age in literature mr g k chesterton says that macaulay felt and used names like trumpets Quote, the reader's greatest joy is in the writer's own joy he says when he can let his last phrase fall like a hammer on some resounding names such as hildebrand or charlemagne the eagles of rome or the pillars of hercules as with sir walter scott some of the best things in his prose and poetry are the surnames that he did not make this is exactly where macaulay is great he is almost homeric the whole triumph turns upon mere names End quote. we have all wondered at the uncanny ingenuity that bunyan and dickens displayed in the manufacture of names to suit their droll and striking characters but we are compelled to confess that homer and milton and macaulay reveal a still higher phase of genius for they succeed in marshalling with rhythmic and dramatic effect the actual names that living men have borne and in weaving those names into glorious pageants of extraordinary impressiveness and splendour it is very odd the way in which history and prophecy meet and mingle in the naming of the baby a friend of mine has just named his child after john wesley he has clearly done so in the fond hope that the august virtues of the great methodist may be duplicated and revived in a generation that is coming it is an ingenious device for transferring the moral excellences of the remote past to the dim and distant regions of an unborn future the phenomenon sometimes becomes positively pathetic i remember reading in the stirring annals of the melanesian mission of a native boy whom bishop john selwyn had in training at norfolk island he had been brought from one of the most barbarous of the south sea peoples and did not promise particularly well one day bishop selwyn had occasion to rebuke him for his stubborn and refractory behavior the boy instantly flew into a passion and struck the bishop a cruel blow in the face it was an unheard-of incident and all who saw it stood aghast the bishop said nothing but turned and walked quietly away the conduct of the lad continued to be most recalcitrant and he was at last returned to his own island as incorrigible there he soon relapsed into all the debasements of a savage and cannibal people many years afterwards a missionary on that island was summoned post-haste to visit a sick man it proved to be dr selwyn's old student he was dying and desired a christian baptism the missionary asked him by what name he would like to be known call me john selwyn the dying man replied because he taught me what christ was like the day when i struck him we have a wonderful way of associating certain qualities with certain names the name becomes fragrant not as the rose is fragrant but as the clay is fragrant that is long lain with the rose i see that two european newspapers have recently taken a vote as to the most popular name for a boy and the most popular name for a girl and in the result the names of john and mary hopelessly outdistanced all competitors but why there is nothing in the name of john or in that of mary to account for such general attachment some names like lily or rose or violet suggest beautiful images and are loved on that account but the name of john and the name of mary suggest nothing but the memory of certain wares how then are we to account for it the riddle is easily read long long ago on a green hill far away there stood by the cross of jesus his mother and the disciple whom jesus loved and when mary left that awful and tragic scene she left it as jesus himself desired she should leave it leaning on the arm of john and because these two were first in the human love of jesus their names have occupied a place of special fondness in the hearts of all men ever since like the fly held in amber the memory of great and sterling qualities is encased and perpetuated in the very names we bear i like to dwell on the memorable scene that took place at the burial of longfellow 
a notable company gathered at the poet's funeral and among them emerson came up from concord his brilliant and majestic powers were in ruins he stood for a long long time looking down into the quiet dead face of longfellow but said nothing at last he turned sadly away and as he did so he remarked to those who stood reverently by the gentleman we are bearing to-day was a sweet and beautiful soul but i forget his name yes that is the beauty of it all the name perpetuates and celebrates the memory of the goodness but the memory of the goodness lingers after the memory of the name is lost i shall enjoy the fragrance of the roses over my lattice when i can no longer recall the names by which they are distinguished mrs booth used to love to tell a beautiful story of a man whose saintly life left its permanent and gracious impress upon her town he seemed to grow in grace and charm and in all nobleness with every day he lived at the last he could speak of nothing but the glories of his saviour and his face was radiant with awe and affection whenever he mentioned that holy name it chanced that as he was dying a document was discovered that imperatively required his signature he held the pen for one brief moment wrote and fell back upon the pillows dead and on the paper he had written not his own name but the name that is above every name within sight of the things within the veil that seemed to be the only name that mattered End of Part 3, Chapter 5。Part 3, Chapter 6 of Mushrooms on the Moor。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part 3, Chapter 6. The Mistress of the Margin. I love a margin. There is something delicious, luxurious, glorious in the spacious field of creamy paper bounded by the black letterpress on the one side and the gilt edges on the other. Could anything be more abominable than a book that is printed to the uttermost extremities of every page? It is an outrage, I aver, on human nature. Indeed, it is an outrage on nature herself, for nature loves her margins even more than I do. She goes in for margins on a truly stupendous scale. She wants a bird, so a dozen are hatched. She knows perfectly well that eleven out of the twelve are merely margin. She will throw them to the cats and the foxes and the weasels and the snakes, and only keep the best of the batch. She wants a tree, so she plants a hundred. She knows that ninety and nine are margin, to be browsed down by cattle, but she means to make sure of her one. The row of a cod, Grant Alien tells me, contains nearly ten million eggs, but if each of those eggs produced a fish which arrived at maturity, the whole sea would immediately become a solid mass of closely packed codfish. But nature has no intention of turning her bright blue ocean into a gigantic box of sardines. She is simply providing herself with a margin. Linnaeus says that a fly may multiply itself ten thousandfold in a fortnight. If this increase continued through the three summer months, he says, one fly at the beginning of summer would produce one hundred millions of millions of millions before the three months were over, and the air would be black with the horror. The probability, however, is that there are never one hundred millions of millions of millions of flies in the whole world. Nature is not arranging for a repetition of the plague of Egypt. She is simply gratifying her appetite for a margin. As Tennyson sings in In Memoriam, of fifty seeds she often brings but one to bear. So, I suppose, I learned my love of margins from her. At any rate, if anyone thinks me extravagant, they must quarrel with her and not with me. I fancy there's a good deal in it. It is the margin that makes all the difference. If the work that absolutely must be done occupies every waking moment of my time, I am a slave. But if it leaves a margin of a single hour, I am in clover. If my receipts will only just balance my expenditure, I am living a mere hand-to-mouth existence. But if they leave me a margin, I jingle the odd coins in my pocket with the pride of a prince. Mr. Micawber's philosophy comes back to us. Quote, annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 19, 19, 6. Result, happiness. Annual income, 20 pounds. Annual expenditure, 20 pounds, ought and 6. Result, misery. End quote. I believe that one of the supreme aims of a man's life should be to secure a margin. Nature does it, and we must copy her. A good life, like a good book, should have a good margin. I hate books whose pages are so crowded that you cannot handle them without putting your thumbs on the type. And in exactly the same way, there are very few things more repelling than the feeling that a man has no time for you. It may be a most excellent book, but if it has no margin, I shall never grow fond of it. He may be a most excellent man, but if he lacks leisure, restfulness, and poise, I shall never be able to love him. 
It is difficult to account for it, but the fact most certainly is that the most winsome people in the world are the people who make you feel that they are never in a hurry. The man whom you trust most readily is a man with a little time to spare, or who makes you think that he has. When my life gets tangled and twisted, and I want a minister to help me, I shall be too timid to approach the man who is always in a fluster. I feel instinctively that he is far too busy for poor me. He tears through life like a superannuated whirlwind. If I meet him on the street, his coat-tails are always flying out behind him, his eyes wear a haunted look, and a sense of feverish haste is stamped upon his countenance. He reminds me of poor John Gilpin, for it is always neck or nothing with him. He seems to be everlastingly consulting his watch, and is always muttering something about his next engagement. He gets through an amazing number of odd jobs in the course of a day, and his diary will be a wonder to posterity, but he would be much better off in the long run if he cultivated a margin. He makes people feel at present that he is far too busy for them. A poor woman who is in great trouble about her son heard him preach last Sunday and felt that she would give anything to have a quiet talk with him about her sorrow and kneel with him as he commended both her and her wayward boy to the throne of heavenly grace. But she dreads to be caught in the whirl of his week-a-day flurry and stays away, her grief eating her heart out the while. A shrinking young girl is in perplexity about her love affairs and she feels sure from some things he said in a sermon a few weeks ago that he could help her but she remembers that in his study he keeps a motto to remind her that his time is precious. If the words, Beware of the dog, were painted on his study door, they could not have been more terrifying. She fears that, before she has half unfolded the tender tale that she scarcely likes to tell, his hand will be upon the doorknob. The tendency of the time is indisputably towards flurry. The flurry of business or the flurry of pleasure. I feel very sorry for those busy folk. Their energy is prodigious, but for all that they are losing life's best. Shirley William Cowper had a secret in his soul when he told us that, in his mad career, John Gilpin lost the wine. And now, as he went bowing down, his reeking head full low, the bottles twain behind his back were shattered at a blow. Down ran the wine into the road, most piteous to be seen, which made his horse's flanks to smoke, as they had basted been. It is very easy to go too fast. In his Forest, Mr. Stuart White gives us some lessons in bushmanship. Quote, as long as you restrain yourself, he says, to a certain leisurely plodding, you get along without extraordinary effort, but even a slight increase of speed drags fiercely at your feet. One good step is worth six stumbling steps. Go only fast enough to assure that good one. An expert woods walker is never in a hurry. End quote. I was chatting the other day with the captain of a great steamship. The vessel is capable of steaming at the rate of 17 knots an hour but I noticed from the log that she never exceeds fifteen. I asked the reason. It's too expensive, the captain answered, and then he told me the difference in the consumption of coal between steaming at fifteen and steaming at seventeen knots an hour. It was astounding. I recognized at once his wisdom in keeping the margin. When I next meet my busy brother, I shall tell him the story, if he can spare the time to listen. For apart from the expense to himself of driving the engines at that high pressure, and apart from the loss of the wine, I feel sure that the folk who most need him love the ministry of a man with a margin. Even as I write, there rush back upon my mind the memories of great doctors and eminent lawyers whose biographies I have read. How careful these busy men were to convey a certain impression of leisureliness. It will never do for a doctor to burst in upon his poor feverish patient and throw everything into commotion and see how composedly the lawyer listens to his client's tale. Wise men these, and I must not be too proud to learn from them. Great souls have ever been leisurely souls. I have no right to allow the rush and throb and tear of life to rob me of my restfulness. I must keep a quiet heart. I must be jealous of my margins. I must find time to climb the hills, to scour the valleys, to explore the bush, to row on the river, to stroll along the sands, to poke among the rocks, and to fish in the stream. I must cultivate the friendship of the fields and the ferns and the flowers. I must lie back in my easy chair with my feet on the fender and laugh with my friends. And pity me, men and angels, if I am too busy to romp with the children and to tell them a tale if they want it. There are many things in a man's life that he can give up, just as there are many things in a book that can be skipped. But the last thing to go must be the margin. Now, rising from my desk for a moment, just to stretch my legs a little, I glance out of my study window at the busy world outside. I see men making bargains, reading newspapers, and talking politics. And really, when you come to analyze the thing, this matter of margins touches the bustling world at every point. To begin with, the essential difference between life here in Australia and life in the old world is mainly a difference in the breadth of the margin. 
here life is not so hemmed in and cramped up as it must of necessity be there the whole tendency of modern legislation is in the direction of widening the margin everything tends to increase the leisure of the people early closing has come into its own shopkeepers put up their shutters quite early in the morning the hours of the laborer have been considerably curtailed and in other ways the leisure of the people has been greatly increased now in this broadening of life's margin there lie both tremendous possibilities and tremendous perils the idleness of an entire community during a considerable portion of its waking hours may become a huge national asset or a serious menace to the general well-being people are too apt to suppose that character is determined by the main business of life it is a fallacy it is as i have said the margin that really matters there is a section of time that remains to a man after the main business of life has been dealt with it is the use to which that margin is put that reveals the true propensities of the individual and that in the long run determines the destiny of the nation here for example are two bricklayers they walk down the street side by side on their way to work from the time that the hour strikes for them to commence operations until the time comes to lay aside their trowels for the day they are pretty much alike the one may be a philosopher and the other a scoundrel but these traits will have small opportunity of betraying themselves as they chip away at the bricks in their hands and ply their busy tasks the intellectual proclivities of the one and the vicious propensities of the other will be held in the severest restraint as they labor side by side the inexorable laws of industrial competition will keep their work up to a certain standard of excellence but the moment that the tools are thrown aside the character of each man stands revealed he is his own master he is like a hound unleashed and will not follow his bent without let or hindrance and the more the state restricts the hours of toil and multiplies the hours of leisure the more does it increase the possibilities of good in the one case and the perils of evil doing in the other it is during that lengthened leisure that the one will apply himself to self-improvement and by developing himself will increase the value of his citizenship to the state and it is during the prolonged immunity from restraint that the other will compass his own deterioration and exert his influence for the general impoverishment precisely the same law holds good in relation to the expenditure of money the way in which a people spends its money represents the most crucial test of a national character if a man spends his money wisely he is a wise man if he spends his money foolishly he is a foolish man but it is not along the main line of expenditure that revelation is made the principal items of expenditure are inevitable and beyond the control of the individual whoever or whatever he may be a man must eat and wear clothes whether he be a burglar or a bishop the butcher the baker and grocer and the milkman will call at every door and you cannot argue as to the morals of a man from the fact that he eats bread and he is fond of beef or that he takes sugar with his porridge there are certain main lines of expenditure along which each man whatever his characteristics and idiosyncrasies is resistlessly driven but after he has submitted to this stern compulsion and has paid his butcher his baker his grocer and his milkman then comes the test what about the margin is there a margin for upon the margin everything depends we will suppose that after paying for the things that he eats and the things that he wears he still jingles in his pocket a dozen coins with which he may do exactly as he likes now it is in the expenditure of that margin of money as in the other case it was the expenditure of the margin of leisure that the real man will reveal himself it is the use to which he puts the margin that declares his true character and determines the contribution that he as an individual citizen will make to the national weal or woe now if this broadening margin means anything at all it means that the responsibilities of the church are increasing for the church is essentially the mistress of the margin concerning the expenditure of the hours occupied with labor and concerning the money spent in the actual requisites of life the statesman may have something to say legislation may deal with the hours of labor and the rates of wages it may even influence the precise amount of the butcher's or the baker's bills but when it comes to the hours that follow toil and to the cash that remains after the principal accounts have been paid the legislator finds himself in difficulties he has come to the end of his tether he cannot direct the people as to how to spend their spare cash and as we have seen it is just this spare time and spare cash that determine everything it is the dominating and deciding factor in the whole situation it is manifest therefore that important as are the functions of statemanship the really fundamental factors of the individual conduct and of national life elude the most searching enactments of the most vigilant legislators as the hours of labor shorten and as the margin of spare cash increases the authority of the legislator becomes less and less and the need for some force that shall shape the moral tone of the people becomes greater and greater if the church cannot supply that force and become the mistress of the margin the outlook is by no means reassuring 
on one phrase of this matter of the margin the church holds a wonderful secret she knows that there are people who through no fault of their own are marginless they have neither a moment nor a penny to spare sickness trouble and the war of the world have been too much for them they are right up against the wall and they know it but the matter does not end there i remember once entering a dingy little dwelling in the slums of london in the squalid room a cripple girl sat sewing and as she sewed she sang my father is rich in houses and lands he holdeth the wealth of the world in his hands of rubies and diamonds of silver and gold his coffers are full and has riches untold i am the child of a king the child of a king i am the child of a king the child of a king with jesus my saviour i am the child of a king what did this mean but that she had discovered that her cramped and narrow life had a spacious white margin after all in a recent speech at glasgow mr lloyd george told a fine story of a quaint old welsh preacher who was conducting the funeral service of a poor old fellow a member of his church who through no fault of his own had a very bad time of it they could hardly find a space in the churchyard for his tomb at last they got enough to make a brickless grave amongst the towering monuments that pressed upon it and the old minister standing above it said well davy you have had a narrow time right through life and you have a very narrow place in death but never you mind old friend i can see a day dawning for you when you will rise up out of your narrow bed and find plenty of room at the last ah he cried in a burst of natural eloquence i can see it coming i can see that day of resurrection i can see the dawn of immortality there will be room 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 even for the poor the light of that morning already gilds the hilltops what did he mean that old welsh minister as he shaded his eyes with his hands and looked towards the east he was pointing away from life's black and crowded letterpress to the white and spacious margin the margin with the gilt edge that was all End of Part 3, Chapter 6《Part 3, Chapter 7 of Mushrooms on the Moor》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Lillis. • Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum Part 3, Chapter 7 • Lily I was once advised to write a novel. I scouted the suggestion at the time, and I scout it still. If you write a novel, you run a great risk. One of these days, somebody may read it. You never know what queer things people may do nowadays. And if somebody should read it, your secret is out, and the paucity of your imagination stands grimly exposed. No, I shall not write a novel, although this article will be something in the nature of a novelette. For I have found a heroine, and many a full-blown novelist, having found a heroine, would consider that he had come upon a novel ready-made. My heroine is Lily, and Lily, to break the news gently, was a pig. I say was advisedly, for Lily is dead, and therein lies the pathos of my story. And so I have my heroine, and I have my story, and I have my strong suffusion of sentiment all ready to my hand. And really I feel half inclined to write my novel after all. But let me state the facts, for which I am prepared to vouch, that then it will be time enough to see if we can weave them into a great and classical romance." away on the top of a hill in a rural district of tasmania there stands a quaint little cottage down the slopes around and away along the distant valleys are great belts of virgin bush but here on the hill is our quaint little cottage and in or about the cottage you will find a quaint little couple they may not be able to discuss the latest aspects of the balkan question or the irish crisis or the mexican imbroglio but they can discuss questions that are very much older and are likely to last very much longer for they can discuss fowls and sheep and pigs, and depend upon it, fowls and sheep and pigs were discussed long before the Balkan question was dreamed of, and fowls and sheep and pigs will be discussed long after the Balkan question is forgotten. And so the old couple makes you feel ashamed of your simpering superficiality. You are amazed that you can have grown so excited about the things of the moment, and you blush for your own ignorance of the things that were and are and shall be. Yes, John and Mary can discuss fowls, for they have a half-dozen of them, and can call each bird by name." Whilst poor Mary's back was turned for a moment, the rooster flew on to the table. "'Really, Tom, you naughty boy!' she cried on discovering the outrage. "'I am ashamed of you.' And to impress the whole feathered community with the enormity of the offence, she proceeded to drive them all out of the kitchen. "'Go on, Lucy!' she cried with a note of sadness betraying itself in her voice in spite of her assumed severity. "'Go on, Lucy!' And she flapped her apron to show that she meant it, much as an advancing army might defiantly flutter its flag." go on and you too minnie and nelly and kate and nancy you must all go it was a dreadful thing to do i don't know what you were thinking of tom i said that john and mary could discuss sheep but their flock was a very limited one for it consisted entirely of birdie the pet lamb 
i cannot tell probably through some defect in my imagination why they called him birdie nor fancy for that matter why they called him a lamb i can imagine that he may have been a lamb once but of feathers i could discover no trace at all yes after all these are prosaic details and only show how incompetent a novelist i should prove to be i grovel when i ought to soar john and mary were very fond of birdie and birdie was very fond of them he came trotting up when he was called wagging his long tail as though a proof positive that he was still a lamb it was scarcely a triumph of logic on Bertie's part, and yet it was just about as good as the artistic subterfuges by which lots of us try to convince the world and his wife that we are still in the charming stage of lamb-like simplicity. And then there was Lily. The old couple were very fond of Lily. How carefully they made her bed on cold nights! How considerately they fed her on boiled potatoes, skim milk, and other wondrous delicacies! She, too, came shambling up whenever she heard her name, and with a grunt acknowledged their bounty dear old lily poor mary exclaimed fervently as lily lifted her snout to be rubbed and looked with queer piggish eyes into those of her doting mistress yes lily was a pig but she was none the worse for that and if any ridiculous person objects to my taking a pig for my heroine i shall take offence and write no more novels lily i repeat was none the worse for being a pig and i am sure that john and mary were none the worse for loving her it was always safe to love for if you love that which cannot profit by your love your love comes back to you like noah's dove and you yourself are none the poorer. But I am not at all sure that affection was wasted on Lily. Why should it be? There is no disgrace in being born a pig. It did not even show bad taste on Lily's part, for Lily was not asked. She came and found on arrival that she was what men called a pig, and as a pig she performed her part so well that those who knew her grew very fond of her. What more can the best of us do? And after all, why this squeamishness, why this revulsion of feeling, when I announce that my heroine is a pig? I aver that it is a species of snobbery, a very contemptible species of snobbery. Booker Washington used to declare that a high-grade Berkshire boar or a Poland china sow is one of the finest sights on this planet, and one of our own philosophers has gone into rhapsodies over the pig. Pigs, he says, quote, always seem to me like a fallen race that has seen better days. They are able, intellectual, inquisitive creatures. When they are driven from place to place, they are not gentle or meek like cows and sheep who follow the line of least resistance. The pig is suspicious and cautious. He is sure that there is some uncomfortable plot on foot, not wholly for his good, which he must try to thwart if he can. Then, too, he never seems quite at home in his deplorably filthy surroundings. He looks at you up to the knees and ooze out of his little eyes as if he would live in a more cleanly way if he were permitted. Pigs always remind me of the mariners of Homer, who were transformed by Circe. There is a dreadful humanity about them, as if they were trying to endure their base conditions philosophically, waiting for their release." End quote. All this I entreat my critic to lay well to heart before he judges me too severely for selecting Lily as my heroine. I suppose the truth is, if only my supercilious critics could be trusted to tell the whole truth, that Lily is not good-looking enough for them. But that again is a question of taste. Beauty is relative and not absolute. My critics may themselves be at fault. The real trouble may be not want of comeliness in Lily, but a sad lack of appreciation in themselves. I noticed that the champion Yorkshire sow at the Sydney show this year was Mr. E. Jenkins' Queen of Beauty, and as I gazed upon her photograph and noted her alluring name, I thought once more of Lily and laughed in my sleeve at my critics. I once spent a week with an old Lincolnshire gentleman at Kirwee in New Zealand, and almost before I had been able to bolt the meal that awaited my arrival, he begged me to come and see the pigs. And at the very first animal to which we came, my happy host rubbed his hands in an ecstasy of pride, while his eyes fairly sparkled. "'Bain't he a beauty?' he asked me excitedly. And I answered confidently that he was. I could see at a glance that the pig was a beauty to him, and if he was a beauty to him, he was a beauty, and there remained no more to be said. I remember reading a story of two ministers who met beneath the hospitable roof of an old-fashioned English farmhouse. One of them no sooner approached the table than he uttered an exclamation of delight. Picking up one of the cups, he spoke of the wonderful beauty of the china. He held the plates up to the light and asked the others to see how thin they were, and went into ecstasies over the wondrous old china that had been in the farmhouse for many generations. The other took little interest in his talk and could not be aroused to enthusiasm over the china, but when the farmer took out of his cupboard some old books, one of which was a black-letter commentary, he became excited. He turned the pages over lovingly and pointed to the quaint initials and became eloquent over their beauties. The farmer thought both men silly. Neither the china nor the books seemed precious to him. What a heap of nonsense ye be talking, surely, 
he said. "'Now, if you want to see something worth seeing, come along with me, "'and I'll show you the finest litter of pigs in the country.' I know, of course, that beaten at every other point, my critics will take their stand on dietetic grounds. How can you have a pig for your heroine, they will ask, with their noses turned up in disgust. See what a pig eats! Now I confess that this objection did appear to me to be serious until I went into the matter a little more carefully. Before abandoning poor Lily and consigning her to everlasting obscurity, it seemed to me that I owed it to her, as a matter of common gallantry, to investigate this charge. An author has no more right than any other man to toy with feminine affections, and having pledged myself to Lily as my heroine, I dared not commit a breach of promise, save on the most serious grounds. Into this matter of Lily's diet I therefore plunged, with results that have surprised myself. I find that Lily is the most fastidious of eaters. Experiments made in Sweden show that, out of 575 plants, the goat eats 449 and refuses 126. The sheep, out of 528 plants, eats 387 and refuses 141. The cow, out of 494 plants, eats 276 and refuses 218. The horse, out of 474 plants, eats 262 and refuses 212. Whilst the pig, out of 243 plants, eats 72 and refuses 171. From all these fiery ordeals, my heroine, therefore, emerges triumphant, and her critics cut a sorry figure. Theirs is the melancholy fate of all those who will insist on judging from appearance. It is the oldest mistake in the world, and it is certainly the saddest. Many, like Lily, have been judged hastily and falsely, and as in Lily's case, the evil thought has clung to them as though it were a charge established, and under that dark cloud they have lived, shadowed, and embittered lives. Half the pathos of the universe lies just there. One thing affords me unbounded pleasure. If I take Lily for my heroine after all, I shall be following a noble precedent. Michael Fairless, in The Roadmender, did something very much like it. In early spring, she says, quote, I took a long nap. Towards the afternoon, tired and thirsty, I sought water at a little lonely cottage. Bees worked and sang over the thyme and majorum in the garden. And in a homely sty lived a solemn black pig, a pig with a history. It was no common utilitarian pig, but the honored guest of the old couple who lived there, and the pig knew it. A year before, their youngest and only surviving child, then a man of five and twenty, had bought his mother the result of his savings in the shape of a fine young pig. A week later, he lay dead of the typhoid. Hence, the pig was sacred, cared for, and loved by this Darby and Joan. "'E be most like a child to me and the mother, and most as sensible as a Christian, e be,' the old man said." What a world of illusion this is, to be sure. It takes a good pair of eyes to see through its good-humoured trickery. You see a pig turning this way and that way as he wanders aimlessly about the yard, and you never dream of romance. And yet that pig is none other than Lily. You see another pig in a commonplace sty, and you never dream of pathos. But old Joan wipes a tear from her eye with her apron when she remembers how that pig came into her possession. There is a world of poetry in pigsties. Yes, and pathos, too, of its kind. For as I said, Lily is dead. It was this way. John and Mary are not rich, and a pig is a pig. What about Lily, Mary? John asked awkwardly one day. You see, Mary, she's got to die. If we keep her, she'll die, and if we sell her, she'll only die. If we keep her, Mary, she may die of some disease, and we shall see her in pain. If we sell her, she will die suddenly and feel no pain. And then, Mary, he continued slowly, as though afraid to introduce so prosaic an aspect of so pathetic a theme, and then, Mary, if she dies here, look at the loss, for Lily's a pig, you know. And if we sell her, look at the gain. And with part of the money we can get another pet and be just as fond of it. There were protests and there were tears, but Lily went to market. A while afterwards, John came home from the city with a parcel. Mary, he said hesitatingly, I've brought you home a bit of Lily. I thought I'd like to see how she'd eat. Next morning at breakfast they neither of them ate heartily, but they both tasted. There is food that is too sacred for a glut of appetite. Ah, well, said John at last, those who eat lily will none of them say anything but good of her. That's one comfort. And Mary went.